much for being here tonight. Um, at what I know is going to be a wonderful event. My name is Verity Firth. I'm the Executive Director of Social Justice and the Director of the Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion here at UTS. And I'd like to welcome you all to UTS. I'd like to also acknowledge that we're meeting tonight on the land of the Gadigal people, of the Yorra Nation, and to pay respect to those past and present, and to acknowledge them as the original custodians of knowledge in our land. So, we're very excited to be hosting the Permanent Writers Festival. We, at UTS, we believe that universities exist for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to advance public benefit. And therefore, the idea of hosting a wonderful, radical, informative, insightful uh, series of talks and discussions around feminist writing is absolutely in our sweet spot. We're very lucky and excited to have you here. Um, as I said, I'm heading up the Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion in UTS, and part of our job is about working out the ways that we can maximise the public benefit of the university. We've been very excited to help with this process, but I also wanted to say, take a special thanks to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences as well for being playing a sponsor in role. So, tonight's session. Well, I know you all know what you're here for, but just to give a little bit of an introduction, Anne Summers has been defying expectations her entire life. Her extraordinary career as a journalist, author, policymaker, activist, bureaucrat, board member, editor and publish publisher has seen her travel the world, leading feminist debate, advising Prime Ministers, presiding over Greenpeace International, and writing massive amounts of journalistic articles and eight books. So she's the author of eight books, including the classic Dan Falls and, God, Dan Falls and God's Police, Ducks on the Pond, The Lost Mother, and The Insulting Factor. And I am reliably reporting this on a stand. <laughs> Anne has walked away from success and charged down new paths to satisfy her restlessness and thought for herself and us all to see things differently and expand what is possible. So welcome Anne Summers. show tonight, so I think my question is very succinct. I'm delighted to be interviewing Anne. She's such an iconic and fearless storyteller. She's acknowledged and honoured and dug up the stories of women around her, women in history, women in, in prisons and on Wall Street and in politics for decades, and we are all better off for the work that she has done, I believe, and I Really, <clears throat> I loved this book. It is so rich in detail and those kinds of stories. I want to talk tonight. There is so much to talk about in this book. If you have any book clubs, you must do it because there's really so much to mine. But I want to talk about the title really primarily tonight, which is Unfettered and Alive, and what it means to kind of break free of fetters because we all still do it and you think you've broken through and you're constantly castigating yourself and you find another better. Um, and I want to know how you've done it. But first of all, I guess my question is something I've pondered a lot that my biographer is what makes a life worth telling. And I want to know what has been your 
to Ryan to tell us. Yeah. Well, um, thank you everybody for all coming tonight. It's great to see you. Thank you, Julia, for all your people who still talk. And I've always said I'll try and talk a big long answers to, 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 to preserve your as opposed to. But <laughs> <laughs> um, that, you know, that's a kind of question of the, the idea of biography of cast. Uh, a very, very tough question. Um, but you're right, it goes to the, the point of it all. I guess one of the things that I wanted to do was, there's a, a quote on the back cover of the book where I, I say, and this, is, this comes from the very end of the book, I say that, you know, I grew up expecting to, I was expected to treat the life of the to, to not to influence um, through my husband and children, if at all, and I expected to sort of disappear as I had. Um, he said, I have to find those expectations as have millions of women like me. Um, but the story I wanted to tell everyone is that we've had this fabulous career, you know, we've been from that and what have you, uh, which is true. But I wanted to tell the story of how I was able to do those things, having started life as a very sort of diffident, self loathing, lacking in confidence, fat, ugly girl in Adelaide in the late 1950s and early 60s, uh, and the only, uh, we could use the term role model, but the only lives uh, available to me to sort of guide me to where I might end up were, were those of my mother and her sisters. And my mother was uh, six children and was what was, used to be known as a housewife, I don't even say that anymore really. She was a housewife until the youngest child went to school and she had been in the faculty workforce. She had one sister who was um, a nun, a sister of mercy, and another sister who, uh, in the terminology of the Gothic era, was on the shelf, um, a spinster. She hadn't married, and so you know, it was a bit of a disgrace to the family. And so, to me, she was the, the best. I mean, she was the most glamorous one. She had a job, she had money. She took me out to dinner at Florentino's restaurant in Melbourne, which was the most unbelievably glamorous thing I've ever done in my life. I was 17, and uh, she showed me that um, actually being single and having a job and having money was looked like a pretty good option. <laughs> and with six kids and nappies and all that stuff that we had at home. Um, so I've always been very grateful for my honey man. Unfortunately, she died at the age of 32 from, from the disease, but she, she uh, really showed me um, that you could that there were different options. And then I think the other source of my knowledge of really growing up in a very conservative Adelaide in that era was, was books. I mean, the, the lives that you wanted to lead, the life I wanted to lead, I couldn't see it around it. So you, you read about it, you read books. And it was interesting that there were very few Australian books that I could find in that era that sort of cast it. I'd say the only character in Australian fiction that I really identified with was Judy in Seven of the Australians, and she died when she was 14. So, <laughs> one of the things I really admire about Frank Morehouse and his trilogy of books is he has created this fantastic woman, um, Edith Campbell Barry, um, who is exactly the kind of woman I would wish to have been around in the fifty when I was growing up. And I'm not very glad that she's, she's finally dead now. I think we need more such characters. So, what I wanted to do was to sort of show that it doesn't matter where you start or what, what your situation is. So as once you realise that you are in charge of your life, and once you realise that uh, you can do what you want to do, and if, if you're brave, and if you're willing to be, um, if, if you're willing to take risks, and if you're willing to um, endure the pain of rejection and the pain of failure, um, you can do anything. And just because you fail doesn't mean you're finished. It means okay, you stop doing that. You do something else. Mm -hmm. Another title could be on the shelf. And summer's on shelf long. Will you tell us why you called it unfettered and alone? And tell us what those fetters were. Because you say at one point in the book, when you talk about the complicated relationship of Simone and Bob Bond, these kind of words thread through this book. You say we're all prisoners of our own information. Have you been a prisoner? Well, I 
just to, to give a slightly more mosaic answer initially, um, the reason that I've chosen this title for the book is because of the show Obama. Because uh, for the five years it's taken me to write the book, four and a half of the, the book was going to be called Becoming. And that was going to take it from Simone de Beauvoir, uh, whose, uh, whose, whose phrase, one is not born, another one becomes a woman, was sort of like, like the, the, the signature uh, quotation that, that guided me throughout my life. And it seemed to me that the coming was, was another way of telling my story. And then in February this year, I met Phil Obama, and the book came out, and the same month as mine, it was called Becoming. <laughs> so that was the end of that. I think it was before February, wasn't it? I saw you in New York. And Anne was like, it was really cold. The ice had like frozen all her pipes. Yes. It, it, it had flooded the apartment. She and Chip were like in a nearby hotel. Yes. The two of them working in one little room together. And Michelle Obama had taken the game. Yes. 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 yes, so it was a pretty bad week. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I think she did me a favour and I think because this title is much better. And, <laughs> Thrilled with the way in which people have responded to the title. And even I was quite, I mean, shocked yesterday to, to, to talk to somebody who um, had no idea where it came from. I, I, I thought everybody would know. Where do you know where it comes from? Joni. Joni. Joni Mitchell. Yes, yes. Um, and I thought, so, um, anyway, so it's interesting that it, the title works even for people who don't know where it's from. But there is Joni Mitchell who, you know, probably it's provided the soundtrack for most of my life. I remember when I was writing down Doors and Bells for Leaves, I had these Joni Mitchell cassette tapes that I used to play on a little cassette player that was on the, up on the floor beside my desk and a very tinny sound, but you know, I would have been playing that song back then and it's still with me. Um, I'm telling the alive, it's a line from a song called Bring Down in Paris. And it's, it's, it's about the Soviet Union coming down. And I guess in my situation, um, you know, I made the decision not to have children uh, fairly early on in my life. It was a decision that was tested a number of times subsequently when I inadvertently became pregnant and had to make decisions about what to do and whether I decided not to, not to proceed with it. And, and I have to just add at this point, I do not want to trivialise in any sense at all what happened to me and having four children, but I do have a little smile. When, when um, you spoke about going for the one and then you maxed out your credit card on beautiful high heels, because that's so you. Three pesos to let us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's always got these incredible stilettos on it every single Not today. Uh, I, think, I think I've surrendered. <laughs> it's so <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, we continue. Although, although last Friday night in Adelaide, uh, Julia Gillard interviewed me, and uh, it was a wonderful event. It was like a return bout from when I with her at the Sydney Opera House uh, five years ago, and we decided that we would wear the same clothes as we wore to the Opera House <laughs> event. So that involved my having to go to my house, but I didn't even know what to wear to, but I did have a few things you know, upstairs in the attic, including my shoe museum, uh -huh. with my famous red stiletto that I wore that day. So I borrowed them and wore them again on Friday night, and um, they became a little bit of a hit on Instagram. <laughs> Okay, so the fetters of the people that so we were talking about one of them was one of them was children. I, 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 I mean, not having children um, was a decision I made, um, about which I don't regret at all. It, it enabled me to have a, uh, if you like, a, an ability to accept, um, you know, most of the things I've done in my life are things that other people have thought I should do. But that didn't ever occur to me that I should run the opposite of the status of women, or that I should buy the Miss Magazine, or that I should read the then we went to these people come to me and said, why don't you do this? I'm like, mm, okay, that's a interesting, good idea. And I've been able to accept these challenges because I didn't have to worry about um, you know, other people's lives. Um, I have a partner, who I've been with for the last 30 years, but because you know, we are pretty you know, global and we've had zoom around the world to different countries uh, for, for, for various opportunities. So that's one thing. But I guess the other thing is that um, I have learned to, I don't think it's taken any, any decades, but I have learned to not care enough about what people think of me for that to determine me doing what I want to do. And that might sound like a very simple thing. And I to me, it's a simple thing, but I know from talking to 
particularly young women, how worried they are about what they're going to get. And I think a lot of young women find it very hard to um, not care what they're going to get. So I think as a sort of older feminist, one of the things that perhaps we have failed in is, is in communicating to women that you don't have what you like to. You sort of really don't like to be doing what you want to do after being one of your friends with anyway. You know, those are the people that will like you. So we have to learn to be more confident um, about ourselves and our own decisions and our own choices and not be um, intimidated or um, deterred by other people. Can you even imagine what your life would have been like if you were in the time of No. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't... Um, I mean, I was very young, I was in my teens, and I, you know, I was, remember I had a, 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 um, a, 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 on my wall, uh, beside my bed, a, a, a page from the dear, you know, like my first word, and you know, all, all things on earth, you know, I heard my first as woman, and I was going through a very sort of bitter stage, you know, wish, wishing I hadn't been born a woman, uh, because it was so horrible, but but I, 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 that phase didn't last very long. And I can't imagine being anything other than who I am. And I certainly don't um, regret um, being female. I have five brothers. I'm a first class of with men. And I don't, um, I, don't, I, guess, I don't envy them at all. I mean, I guess the other reason I wanted to write this book, um, and I, I see the book in many ways not so much as, as a story about me, I see it as a history of the era, a history of, of, of the last 40 years, looking at various institutions such as politics, such as journalism, such as um, uh, feminism, uh, international environmental organisations, and in which I am a central character in many of these stories, but in some of them I'm, I'm just a bystander or an observer. I'm, I'm really trying to tell the story of how I, as an individual, Managed the last 40 years and how I went from being a girl in Adelaide to whatever I am today. Um, but it's also, so, which can be an exemplary tale for other, other, other people uh, to follow. Um, but it's also you know, the story of our times. And you know, we've, we've, I've been fortunate to be on the cusp of an extraordinary period of history when, you know, if I'd been born 10 years earlier, if I was my mother, then like my grandmother. <coughs> I wouldn't have had anything like the same opportunities for education, for employment, for travel, um, for independence, um, for all of the things that, that I've been able to benefit from and which uh, women after the younger than me could benefit from even more. Um, and our lives really have been transformed. I've been very fortunate to be on that cusp. And so it's also partly the story of how we as women have, um, if you like, existed within this changing world um, while trying to change it and while not accepting a lot of things about that world, wanting to change it, but happy to exist within it while it's, you know, while it's in the process of change and transformation and also a process, as I've described, of pushback. You know, we've had a lot of setbacks. There's a chapter in the book called The Getting of Anger, where I describe um, my anger about that, the personal pushback that I experienced and also the political pushback idea occurred in this country after 1996 when John Howard was elected. So it's trying to sort of bring all of those characteristics in together. And I think that's really what a life is, because it's not just, you know, and it's the big society, it's the big picture and it's sort of this big, the bigger picture. I'd like to return to that question of anger, actually. But one thing I wanted you to talk about is that I'm so fascinated by your stories of journalism in the 70s and the piece from the National Times to the Financial Review and the hard drinking <laughs> oh, and those long lunches and the kind of, it, it just the, I mean it was the beginning of the <laughs> One thing I didn't put in the book, I'm just saying to someone last night, I, I, I regret now that it's the beginning that when I used to write my Canberra Observe column at the Canberra Review on Friday nights, uh, Thursday nights at Friday's paper. It would generally be a six can job. <laughs> <laughs> they were all drunk. All, all like 
20 years. Yeah. 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 It's all in here. We could carry it. pages into sections like look and some of the you know this was the narrative non-fiction the Tom Wolf era the beginning of long form journalism a whole different way um which which you write about how creative you were with the way you were storytelling I loved that one it wasn't published actually the story you told about wanting to give your Christmas hampers of a turkey in the back of the car to the homeless guys and then they just all kind of grabs the flesh off it and then they all pull it out with penises and you just and you said say this is what I'd really like for Christmas and you went back and wrote it up and put it on your editors and so I was just being creative piece of writing and it didn't go down very well. He published it. Oh yeah, yeah I published, published it. Published it. Um, but looking at that I was conscious. But it was psychedonic. I was sort of setting myself up as a stupid socially aware female that could go and dispense good cheer at What's that part? It's like Yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. But it just struck me as the kind of story that before would not have been told. Of course. And you were yeah. telling stories yeah. about prisons as well as looking at, you know, at, at corruption and looking at the police force and so on. But what struck me about some of this reporting was that as you must have been writing this, the Me Too movement was cascading over the landscape. And you were talking about how you reported on rape trains in rural Queensland. You were talking about kind of you know, groping and you know, harassment by cabinet ministers. And a really interesting dispute with David Ma if you had a, you know, of, of your disagreement about whether the woman who claimed to have been raped at St Paul's College, who believed the men, the GD, and who believed the women, the GD. And so what we did was we, you know, after we, we, we locked ourselves away in my apartment because we thought we could not make a great play. It was <laughs> three days it was the play. We, we couldn't agree. So in the end, what we had to do is, you know, is, and it was kind of pioneering a new way of writing about it. But it was, it was about um, some stuff about the St. Paul's College, the Women's College, back in um, 1976, I think it was. And... Um, the story reflected our inability to reach agreement, which in fact reflected what the law was. And it was a very powerful way of telling the story. Some of you can remember. You talk about the, the rape trains. I mean, that to me was so deeply shocking to reread. I had never read it in that way. No. Um, this was again in 1976, uh, so it was in my uh, first year of working at the National Times, and uh, I, it was a story I did with two um, colleagues, Bruce Stannard and Bruce Hanford, and one of them, one of the guys who had heard from um, a friend who had been met at somebody in an office, who came from a town in North Queensland called Inner, um, that there used to be what were known as the trains in the, in the uh, cane fields, and uh, that is that you know, people would be at the pub on Saturday night, and the couple would leave the pub and go off together, and, and Guys in the pub would go toot toot, and you know they'd follow. Fifty guys would follow, and they'd all rape the girl. And this was happening. Like, uh, oh, just one little gasp. Yeah, the same but, gasp reading. But this is. I mean, well, this is shocking, right? Because I have sort of known about this for a while, and you know, so I'm over the shock. But but we were you know shocked. It's a good truth, sort of thing, right? So you know, we got on the phone. And Bruce got on the phone and rang the cops in in Ingham, and I said, oh yeah, yeah, this happens. You know, we're, we're giving up. We just can't. You know, we can't give up any. No one will be playing, whatever. Um, so we, we were sent up there. It was very unusual in those days to send three journalists on one story. It was even more unusual to send anyone to North Queensland and uh, and to do a story like that. Um, so, but we went up there. We, we went to Townsville. We got a rented a car. We drove from Townsville to Ingham. And we were only there for one day. But we'd done a lot of kind of preliminary work. And we divided up the work in, in that 
it's an oh, again, I was never going to talk to the girls. And uh, the two guys were never going to talk to the, the men, they, the, the men being the police, um, the magistrate, the local newspaper editor, and if they could find them, some of the actual, you know, rapists, I'm not going to use that word. Um, and we covered an amazing amount of ground in just one day. I think I spoke to about three or four girls who'd been raped. Um, I spoke to a teacher who said, you know, every time she saw a girl come into her room in tears, she thought, oh no, that girl got raped. And the police who said, look, you know, we just can do nothing about it. And so we put together this very, very powerful story that, that ran over about five or six pages in the National Times and it caused an absolute sensation. And I think it was because that the story in itself was very, very shocking. But back then, crime was, crime was there were crime pages, you know, police blotter sort of stories, but these sorts of stories were never told in the main part of the paper. And they certainly weren't told in a sort of narrative fashion and from a feminist perspective, because I'd been on the paper straight from writing down rules and rules for rapes, and you know, they were quite happy with me bringing some of those points of view into my stories. And uh, so it, it, it caused a huge sensation. And Premier Majorca Peterson was on the ropes about it. There was a very you know, terrific woman, Liberal Party member of uh, Parliament, Queensland, wrote that quite a lot to talk about and was forced pushing for law reform. Um, so it was, it was, it was interesting. See, see, the fact that all the, the Me Too movement was happening, making it reflect differently at all on what you were doing and, and the stories you were bringing to light. Oh, like a, no, <clears throat> sorry, no, no, but as in, you're, you're writing your memoir about these stories that were previously not told. And we're still having the same conversations, obviously they're not about trees, but about consent and about rape, about domestic violence, and you set up the, you know, the first refuge in Australia. Did it make you think how we're still struggling with the same issues? I think we are, but, but what, what, what is different is that our... Um, um, our understanding of, our, of issues has evolved. Um, our, our willingness to confront things has evolved, and we do th see things differently. I mean, the, our, our whole knowledge of, of rape, for example, um, was so incredibly sort of enlarged and enhanced by Susan Brownman's book, Against Our Will, which I think was published in 1976, and also um, Jermaine Greer's book. Um, that she introduced concepts such as date rape. And that kind of made, suddenly made sense of, oh, all these things used to happen to you when you went out with guys, you wouldn't take no for an answer. That wasn't rape because you knew him. That rape was something, that was a stranger in a dark alley, that was rape, as far as we've been brought up to believe. And it was, you know, as our, as our consciousness expanded and our you know, analytical, um, I guess our, our, our ability to analyse the situation expanded, you know, we came to understand that things, that rape was, you know, it's, it's different types of that. It was all forced sex, but uh, there were different situations to, to describe it. And I think that same, you know, something like sexual harassment, I mean, that, that term wasn't coined until, you know, the late 60s. We didn't have any, 70s, I think. Mean, we didn't have any language to describe that behaviour, even though the behaviour certainly existed. Uh, but, you know, my mother talks about, she's the first girl to work in a bank, she did milk in New South Wales in the Riverina in uh, you know, 1942 or something, 43, and she said every lunchtime the bank manager would ask her to sit on his knee and tickle her. Well, she said tickle, I don't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she was probably being a little discreet, but, but um, she didn't have a language to describe what that was. So I think that, you know, our, our, our ability to comprehend to name and to sort of understand how these things fit into the overall pattern of male power and you know, male exploitation of, of, of women has really expanded a lot. And the Me Too, I mean, I was I had almost finished the book by the time the first Me Too revelations came out, I think in October um, 2017. In fact, the book was pretty much finished by then, so I got a little reference to Me Too in the major. But we, even before we got that name and that way of characterising, um, I mean, the thing about me too is not about the behaviour, it's about women, um, it's about, it's a statement of empathy. It's about women saying, yes, that happened to me too. And, you know, it's a different form of consciousness raising. It is, because 
I mean, one of the things I find really fascinating about Me Too is that, you know, initially there was criticism, well, you know, these are all white women, they're all Hollywood actresses, they're all well paid, they're famous, they're blah, blah, blah. Women, ordinary men can't identify with that. Well, actually, that was bullshit. Ordinary women identify incredibly, uh, as was you know, the, the Me, Me Too hashtag on Twitter, which I think was um, used something like, you know, 12 million times in a very, very short time. And I just know from people I personally know on, on Facebook and Twitter and in, in face-to-face conversations who, uh, and, and I know one woman who's a factory worker in, in, um, in the Ozarks in, in, in uh, Missouri, she told stories on Facebook about the times in which, you know, all of her life she's been a factory worker, blue collar worker. Um, and she's never before told these stories about how she's been groped, you know, every job she did, a supervisor, or co-worker, and, and you had no recourse, you had nothing you could do about it because you couldn't afford to lose the job, you couldn't complain because half the time the person you complained to would be your boss, so you just put up with it. So, you know, this woman hears, um, um, you know, I don't know what her name is, I don't know what her name is, but saying that she, she said, me too, that happened to me. And okay, my boss wasn't a movie producer, but he had the same power to Know, to deny me employment, and if I don't have employment, I don't have any independence. I can't exist, you know, as, a, as an independent woman. So I think the, you know, the 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 statement of empathy is what's so powerful about it, and the uh, actual behaviour that's being identified with uh, might vary in detail, but the general proposition is the same. It's 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 you know, mostly a a, um, a man abusing his economic uh, power over some women in employment to extract sexual papers. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to work <clears throat> in the Australian media and then the American as a woman? Like I love the parts of the book when you talk about you just your love of Manhattan, the sparkle and the proxy and the beauty of Central Park and the intrigue and the people and the papers and fair winds and all that detail. <laughs> um, I really love but Americans often assume yeah, lunch one day over food. We did it anyway. Yeah, exactly. So that sounds like we spent all that time doing yeah. it. Finally, <laughs> um, but um, a lot of my American friends always assume that Australia is just this terrible, backward, sexist place without acknowledging the. I mean, look at what happened to Hillary Clinton, for example. Um, some of the things I've had said to me in the last hour, but like, I'm often surprised by some of the overt examples, but. What was it like for you then in such an extraordinary and enviable job with this magazine? Well, it was announced in the New York Daily News, headline, Crocodile Dundee to edit Liz. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a, great, a great bit of positioning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they still say that. They still say that. that's what I was called at Harvard by a bunch of people, yeah. Croc Dundee. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very cool. um, I mean, I, I devote two chapters of the book to my experiences at, at Ms. Magazine, and the um, it's, a, it's a sort of very multi-layered story. It's first of all a story of, of um, you know, an iconic feminist magazine that was in financial trouble, and and um, Andrew Yates, who, who was also working for Fairfax on the magazine side, when I was working for Fairfax on the newspaper side in uh, New York in 1986. And we're able to persuade Fairfax to buy me. So it's a, it's a story about how we bought Ms. from Gloria Steinem and how we took it over and how we tried to save her, basically. It's also a story we have another magazine called Sassy, Teenage Girls Magazine, which was an incredibly successful magazine, but we uh, came to grief because the right wing, uh, some women from the right, religious right, took us on and managed to you know, take away our, our advertising by organising boycotts. It's also a story about how we. Um, we call ourselves media mobilettes, not because we're women, but because we're small. Uh, our, our empire was very small. How we were able to arrange to buy, to, uh, to, to raise money on Wall Street to buy the magazines when Fairfax sold them. Um, and it's I love how you talk about the power suit as well. You've got to do that. Right. Well, what happened was, um, you know, we just found out one night, one Sunday night, that young Warwick Fairfax, who some of you will remember what happened, he took over the power suit and privatised family company and blew the place up basically and um, he announced that, that he would be selling all of Fairfax's overseas properties and that was Ms. and Sassy in New York 
and uh, they are the spectator in London and the Stock and Museum in Hong Kong. And Sandra Yates, who is a very, very um, creative you know, business thinker, and I, I, I wasn't at all, but certainly willing to go along with her schemes, she said, um, you know, let's see if we can buy them ourselves. And so she organised a five week um, uh, option period that we could raise the money, $14 million, to repay them and to make that whatever we felt we needed to uh, operate the magazines. We decided that was 20 million uh, because Sassy was doing so well we didn't really need that much. You know, we, 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 could make, we, could, we, if we, we had five weeks to raise the 20 million dollars and Sandra said, well, you know, you, people don't lend money to people who look like they need it. It's true. So we both went out and bought the most expensive suits you could possibly imagine. So this wonderful red and climb suit with huge padded shoulders. And um, she said, and I said to Sam, I've never spent this much money in my life on, on, a, on an outfit, I can't believe it. And she said, well, either we will do this deal, doctor, she always called me doctor, or we'll end up being the best dressed bag ladies in New York. <laughs> As it turned out, we did both. <laughs> we raised the money, then we lost the company. Um, but in terms of the journalism, which was your original question, I mean, what I... The big challenge, I thought, with Ms. Magazine was to, you know, magazine which had been an iconic challenge to commercial women's magazines when it was first established in 1972 by Kathleen Steinem and others. Um, and their um, mission, if you like, had been to create a magazine that um, you know, reflected the changes that were happening in women's lives, that you know, made, as Gloria famously said, you know, the women, existing women's magazines were there to make women feel guilty and insecure about themselves. And so Ms. Magazine was one that would make women feel good about themselves and show the world as it could be for women, get advertising, be a commercial proposition, and um, show a new way for women's magazines. But 15 years on, um, the magazine had kind of, it was now making women feel guilty uh, about themselves. So the circulation had collapsed and the original core readers were still there and they didn't want anything to change. I still wanted to hear all the, you know, the grim stories about how terrible things were. But most women, and particularly younger women, wanted something a bit more optimism, a bit more hope. They didn't want to be made to feel guilty about their lives. They wanted to feel some optimism. Um, advertising had basically dried up, and so the company was very indebted. But when we took it over, we were you know, arrogant enough, I think, to think we could make it work because Sandra's business experience, and I thought my journalistic background and I really really thought I could turn it into a kind of a high quality um, magazine. I mean you remember it was the heyday of magazines back in the year. You know, well presented, well laid out by famous writers and it would be great. Yeah. Not quite a try. <coughs> Do you feel frustrated that we still haven't really seen that magazine that you we imagine? Have, we haven't, no. Okay. Um, I mean, I tried to do it a little bit when I started my own online magazine for a few years and had some nice reports, and we, I tried to do it then by sort of you know, doing big journalism that had feminist assumptions, but it wasn't positioned as a women's magazine, I think, so I had to just freeze it. But no, I don't think, um, you know, it's very hard to get that kind of a publication supported financially, and it's probably, I think it's even also hard to find an audience for it, because not enough people want it, as it turns out, sadly. Mm -hmm. I was saying for so many years, um, traditional male newspaper owners, gallery chiefs, chiefs of staff, underestimate the power of words and then puzzle over it and try and capture it. So there's still that kind of disconnect. And then suddenly something like Mama Mia caters for women will explode and there's a commercial challenge. So I just wonder whether some of the questions you were raising with the owners might still exist. Well, I think they do, um, but I think the, the, the era was the, the company talking about the 80s, you know, the whole context was different. I mean, I got into trouble for, you know, I, I tried to broaden the editorial agenda and, and just say, well, look, you know, women are, you know, we are many things, you know, we're not just our politics and we're not just our, um, you know, you know, we never sort of cover beauty or anything wow. stuff like that, but I, I didn't see why we couldn't cover finances, give women financial advice, they don't have any kind of into control their, their, their lives that way. And, um, and and some other types of um, lighter stuff. And I, and I got roundly criticised for that, you know, for bringing in celebrities, for bringing in, you know, 
fashion. Not even that she can bring fashion. I think we stick in clothes and fashion. I think we would be doing it, but wear clothes. So. <laughs> you can write about them without you know, <laughs> uh, becoming vogue. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was, it was just, it turned out it was hard, it turned out to be impossible. Two things. One is that Gloria's brother could never let go, even though she'd sold the magazine, even though she, she couldn't let that go. And uh, she and I had a sort of superficial friendliness for a couple of years, but then it collapsed very quickly once you know, I was in trouble. Um, and, you know, we had fundamental disagreement about how we wanted to write things. I mean, I guess it all blew up in this very important Angus and Ace in New York about us found being a woman who um, had been a publisher, an editor at Random House and had, had a very, you know, good uh, middle class job. But she lived with this lawyer in a house in um, on West 10th Street in, in the village in New York. And she, they, and they had two adopted children. One was a little girl called Lisa and a, and a little boy who just picked up the book and was going to be a toddler. And these two lived this life of extraordinary depravity. Uh, of drugs and violence, and eventually Heather stopped working. Um, she was subjected to horrific violence from, from, from Joel, uh, Joel, Joel Steinberg, I think. Um, and it all culminated, and it, you know, over many, many months, over a couple of years, the neighbours complained all the time about the terrible noises coming out of this place, but the police weren't able to do anything, and it all culminated one night when Joel uh, beat up little Lisa very badly, and um, left her on the bathroom floor in, in this terribly injured state and he went out to dinner for three hours and left Heather there and during that three hours Heather didn't pick up the phone to the uh, 911 and when Joel returned three hours later the two of them free based uh, crack cocaine all night and about six o'clock the next morning they thought oh we better you know, call 911 and, and by the time the Ambulance arrived, little Lisa was, you know, she, she died before they could do anything. So they were both charged um, initially with, with murder. And the women's movement just absolutely split. I mean, there's still fights about this in New York. Um, split down the middle about the extent to which Heather had any culpability for little Lisa's death. And, and I, as I just tell it in the book, I mean, the two camps could broadly be divided into the Gloria Steinem camp and the Susan Brownlow camp. Susan Brown you know, took the more pragmatic view that, you know, understanding as we are or were about the shocking violence that had been inflicted on Heather Nussbaum, that the, she had some responsibility. You know, she, and the question was, how much agency did she have given the, the severe state of injuries? And of course, the fact she was highly addicted and, and she wasn't functioning. But it's very hard to, to sort of go past that three hours when she could have picked up the phone. So the, the glorious time position was Heather is a total victim and in no way culpable for what happened. And the, the ground one position was that uh, much as we uh, are sorry for what happened to Heather, she must bear some responsibility. And uh, Susan Brown Miller wrote um, an editorial for the New York Times about this and then she wrote a novel, The Baby in the Place, a fictionalised account of it. And I asked her to, to ask her if she would cover the trial for this. And that's a glorious time to all of it. I have at this point of view it representing the magazine. So uh, that was my point of the novel. But you know, it was, it, it was as I say, it represented classic, and it's that similarly with the view, the, with the um, continual um, enmity between Gloria Stein and Betty Friedan. You know, they hated each other, so they famously hated each other. And, and as I, and I knew them both very well, um, and I really you know, had a lot of time for Betty Lee not just the person that she was, but I really admired her <laughs> thinking a lot, and she has written some brilliant books. And the Cradle of Mystique is you know, a huge gift to, to all of us. But I just see them as two you know, opposite and, and opposing um, strands of feminism, you know, the, the sort of the utopian feminism of Gloria Steinem and the more pragmatic feminism of Betty Friedan. Um, and I sort of feel more well, like the two have that side myself. So <clears throat> Only a few more minutes, and I've just got two quick questions. <clears throat> Something else that happened in New York now. On page 67, you say <clears throat> you were trying to find out how do we find the right men 
and how do we conduct ourselves with them? I am all ears and <laughs> well, there is there is an there is an entry in the index. I put to a page in the index called "Sex and the Single Feminist," <laughs> um, and I think the passage you're referring to is my friend Paula Lydiger and I. We used to spend many long nights discussing this question about how we could find men that we um, respected and liked, and, and you know, maybe could have been be, be partners with. Um, it was a time in the women's movement, the women's movement was sort of moving away from men. Uh, Male-identified uh, feminists were being kind of edged out in favour of women-identified feminism and separatism and um, synthetic feminism was becoming more lesbian. And so there were the conversation about what you did if you were a straight woman and you were trying to sort of figure out how to have a relationship with a man, you couldn't have that conversation with the women's movement at that time. So it, it, Paula and I bottles of wine, trying to sort of figure it all out. Um, you know, we both ended up finding people, so it did work out. But it, but it was a big issue at that time. We were talking about the late 70s. And how do you retain your independence, uh, have a life of love and, and happiness, um, and not be not, not surrender who you are, and to find men who are able to relate to independent women is still very difficult. It's probably even more so now. Except for Texans called Chip, yeah. Now, you were speaking earlier on about the need to be brave and to work out that we could make the choices and that we were really like significant and <clears throat> encapsulate what it is, how you unfetter yourself, how you live a life that's unfettered and like, what would it be? How would I characterize it? Yeah, what, yeah, what would you tell the woman says to you? What would you say to do? Um, <laughs> find out the pages, right? <laughs> My book. Oh, what's at the heart of it? I think um, you decide what you know. You, you're in charge. I say you're in charge of your life, and you decide what you want to do. And that choice, you know, it might involve having a partner. It might not. It might involve having children. It might not. It might involve a certain type of job. It might involve self-employment. It might involve you know being. Fun. I mean, whatever it is that you think is right for you. Um, is what you should do. And so I guess, you know, I would say throw off the fetters of other people's expectations. I mean, I was supposed to grow up and marry a lawyer because, you know, or a doctor, something of prestige, so I could have that shining, you know, reflective glory. Um, it never occurred, my parents never occurred to them that I might just create my own glory. And that's what we need to understand that we can do. And in whatever way that we we choose, so, and, and you know, obviously not always, things don't always go to plan, things happen, we have setbacks, we have failures, we have disappointments, but even so, if we can sort of continue to try and push forward and do what we want to do, and don't be forced to, to do something you're not going to do, that's really what I would say. Well, thank you for creating your own glory that we've all asked <laughs> 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 Um, how 
do we deal with the fragility of our lives? You know, it seems like every generation that comes after has to refight these battles, as you say, Catherine, previously, too. Nothing is set in stone, and we've got an enhancing polytheism. But the game is that you do and you have to continue on. So that's how we, that's what we do. Well, I guess this has been one of the, um, the biggest lessons of my life, one of the things that, that, that um, surprised and upset me the most the first time it happened, because I remember when I was writing down the Horse of God's Police, and you know, I, used to, I read about the fact that during the war, so during the war, you know, they get good pay, and they, they did all the jobs that previously they weren't allowed to do, that they were, you know, they were running you know, factories and buying planes and doing everything. And then when the war was over, they were all told to piss off and you know, go home and have the baby boom. And, uh, and their rates of pay dropped by 50, 54% of the male rate. And I thought, well, this is terrible, but you know, that was the war. I just couldn't believe that that was actually a precedent for what might happen to us in, with our generation. <laughs> the exigencies of war and that explained it. So when um, John Howard came along in 1996 mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of basically ripped up almost everything that the Whitman pork and Keating governments had, had done or tried to do, I mean, it was. I mean, I was certainly outraged about it. Um, I wrote a whole book about it called The End of Equality in 2003. Um, but I was also in a state of disbelief because I did think that progress was inexorable. And I, you know, I wasn't expecting, uh, and I was completely unprepared for a situation where all these things that we had fought so hard for, which were, were such tangible benefit to, to women and men, uh, could be got rid of like that. And so, that's been a very tough lesson for us, and it's happened a few times since, as we've seen it happen here in New South Wales, the refuge movement, we lost the refuges, um, and, and we've now kind of had to, I guess, accommodate ourselves to, to understanding that our ways of working are going to change, have had to change, because uh, the world has changed, and we can't keep on doing things the same way. So we have to be more, more adaptable, we have to be tougher, and when we have these setbacks, we've got to learn uh, ways around them. We're still, still working that one out. Other questions from the floor? Hello, Anne. Thank you very much for not only this evening, but for all the work that you've done to, to advance the cause of women in particular. Um, I'm Heather Nanko. I'm the CEO of Anchors, Australia's National Research in Women's Social Development Association. Um, and I, I've been uh, interested in your comments around uh, lots of money going into research and we need to be, we're not really making enough traction, we need to be further exploring the causes. I, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. And I, I guess I'd also like us to reflect on uh, that, that we have to some extent in Australia over the last, uh, really the last, well, since 2008, have achieved a uh, nine jurisdictions, a national plan, a 12-year national plan. So that, to some extent, I think has overcome the problem of having to, re you know, having to re-establish or having the governments take us backwards. It's not a perfect plan, but I think it has uh, taken us some way forward in finding a way to overcome. And I heard from Tammy Council from the initiative of the National Council to reduce violence against women and children, which developed time for action, including the Forest National Plan. So, I, you know, one of the things that we fought for in that uh, National Council and leading up to that was uh, a women, women's sector control uh, research organisation that would go beyond the traditional ways of uh, investigating and, and uh, producing academic <coughs> research, but that would also have an element of um, translating that research into policy and practice. And that's what ANGOS as well is. And I think we have to really um, recognise the importance of that as an entity, as part of a, a, an integrated, you know, cross-jurisdiction response and support that. But what I'm really interested in, and we have we have made some traction, but Annabelle and I were talking about the, the importance of the resourcing to for the implementation of the research and the take up of the research and the leading up to make a difference with the evidence. Um, but I really would love to invite you to come and work with with Anglos and to need to be established under that national plan to drive that change um, and to get your views about the research agenda and where we're going next. But I, I'm 
also really curious about your yeah. comments about that. That would be fantastic. Thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch, and I understand you're meeting with the chair of our board, Sam Lister, um, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so um, no doubt there'll be further conversations there as well. But but I would really um, I'm really interested in the the comment about the need to explore more the cause of Zoom, and I think we are moving as a sector to a more nuanced understanding of the various contributing factors, and that you know there's no one primary cause. Gender is a is a very, very significant factor. The question is, can you talk more about you know, the, the comments about um, cause, the causal factors and you know what you think we need to be investigating in terms of causes of violence because you know that, that's what we're, we're hearing you say as you are um, moving around the country. I, I, you're referring to what I said, a Q&A, I think. I have a huge reaction to that. At which I'm really pleased that uh, people have been so responsive. I mean, basically, for those of you who didn't see it, um, the, the question came up about um, uh, what has happened with violence, and, and uh, going back to Alina's question, is when we did that focus group research in 1992, when I was working with Phoenix Office, and, and uh, violence came up as sort of one of the three top issues that women wanted government to act on in the political space, and then you know, when I read this in the and now it's 2018 and you know, what the hell has happened uh, because we, the incidence appears to have increased, uh, certainly we know more about it and we've had this shocking spate of, of deaths you know, in, in recent weeks. So it's, it's front of mind and I think people are just feeling very frustrated that, that um, you know, we're, we're, we are where we are. And I guess, I mean, it, it requires a lot more conversation I think we can have tonight, but I'll just make the quick point that uh, I, I fully respect what Anrose is doing and how Watch is doing, and there's some fantastic research being done. But I do feel that we are uh, too often ascribing. I mean, we, it's a truism to say that um, gender inequality is, is both a cause and a manifestation of violence and so on. That is true. But where does that get us in terms of, of, of remedial action, preventative action? And so my feeling is that we need to be breaking down violence more into its component parts to perhaps, you know, violence is a huge word, you know, it's a lot of cancer, you know, um, but there are different types of cancer and different types of violence and maybe we need to sort of start investigating different types of violence differently, maybe some lend themselves more to remediation than others, and I don't know, I mean, I'm just talking, uh, but I do think that with all the good work that's been done, we're a little bit stalled, I think, on description. Um, we have a very good understanding of what's happening, but I'm not sure we have a, have a good understanding about where we're going in terms of the direction. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Any further questions? Hi, I'm Kate Jenkins. I'm the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner. I'm currently running the National Inquiry on Sexual Harassment at Work. So I'm just interested in you as a quick consultation to tell us what you think Australia needs to do differently on sexual harassment. <laughs> My question, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm doing 12 months on it, but if you could tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem, Kate, no problem. <laughs> and I'm really pleased you're doing this inquiry. I mean, I, I, one of the things I'm finding very um, puzzling, um, and I haven't really had a chance to talk to many people about it, is that why Me Too hasn't really taken States. And uh, you know, I recently did a big article about it for the Financial Review magazine, which you may have seen. And in the course of doing that, I you know, did the research as to what, what the, the impact um, had been in the first year, from October last year, October this year. And I was able to get the documentation. I think it was 120 you know, very well known men in all sorts of fields, from you know, the famous Harvey Weinstein and, and, and Kevin Spacey and you know, Richard Miles and the chief of the editor of the Paris Review and you know, blah, 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 blah. All of these guys have lost their jobs or lost their positions or been forced to resign as a result of accusations against them which have been investigated, proven to be correct, and they have lost their jobs. Now that's 120 really powerful men, and that is amazing, I think, that there have been these consequences in just a year, and it hasn't involved the courts, it hasn't involved anything, it's just involved women who kept complaining and there's an atmosphere now, it's within you know, corporate America and politics.
Hollywood and anywhere else we look at, that these complaints are taken seriously, they're investigated, and if they are found to be proven, out the door. And, and what we've now seen another very significant development with the guy at CBS, the, <coughs> the, um, the um, CEO of, of CBS, uh, Leslie Nielsen, I think that is, that CBS has agreed to pay um, $20 million to the Me Too movement. So it's, it's just awesome funding, it's not $20 million. Um, <laughs> so why isn't this happening in Australia? I mean, one says, well, it's the defamation laws. Well, you know, I understand the defamation laws. <coughs> Uh, do um, um, restrict what can be reported, but I also know that the Court of Victoria, which this was still the case, I mean, one of the things when I was a journalist, I spent half your week, hours trying to do is how to get around the, the defamation laws in order to publish stories you know to be true. And I don't see the same effort being made here on these sorts of stories as you see being made with other, you know, stories about. Um, obeyed and you know all that stuff. I mean, the effort that was made to that the defamation laws didn't stop those stories. So why are they stopping these? And I, I don't know the answer to that. But people should be asking that question. But I mean, one of the things is that you know the complaints on the Sex Discrimination Act, as I understand it, are at the end of the correct is that the definition? Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> so I mean, there's got to be an opening there, and hopefully you're in and I'm really looking forward to, to the outcome of that, to your, your report. Maybe you're inquiring a bit of catalyst to, you know, discovering what the Australian way will be of, of, of um, airing these me too and getting some, some action and getting some, some consequences. Because we know the behaviour is there. Um, we need to find our own path, I guess, to, to make that happen. I mean, Australia was the first country in the world to legislate against sexual harassment, and that was in the money. Uh, but Me Too has galvanised the issue in a way it's given it a kind of focus and the, an immediacy that all the years of sex doing it wasn't quite able to do. So, so I don't know, I can't answer the question. I can just articulate, yeah, it's your job. <laughs> Good luck. But uh, I agree, you know, we have to kind of move this forward. I'm really interested in, in your views on why, you know, so long after the Sex Discrimination Act and, you know, all the other um, policy initiatives that we've had in Australia emerging, we've gone from probably continuing to see resistance from the broader point of view, but the issue of the uh, gender and wage gap we still have, the number of workers in the country who are not in the findings of um, companies, and there's a lot of that was not going to be part of the assignment. Policy seminar. <laughs> uh, that's just a huge question. I, I just make one point. I would love to see a pay, uh, in, in, a pay equity or pay inequality case brought under sex discrimination. There's no reason why it could be there. And you know, it, we need some big cases. Uh, and that's a great way to dramatise uh, the issue. It's a great way to get publicity. I mean, I, my firm view is we're not going to get equal pay until it's legislated. We've got to get it out of fair work, get out of the industrial relations system. They've had 50 years to do it, they haven't, they fail us. So I think we've got to get to the parliament. And I think that maybe a, a sex week case would be a great way to do it. And I think the, the, one of the other things that I think we need to do, and maybe I haven't done it now before, is the way we, we reduced the powers of the Act. We took away the complaint handling. Um, Abilities of the commissioner, you know, there are all sorts of things that the sector commissioner used to be able to do, but are no longer possible. And then, of course, he took away the budget, so you know, eight and uh, her predecessors have been 
severely constrained in what they can do because we have more of an educative function than an enforcement function. And it will be this great balance that gives the community groups, and unions, whatever, who bring some cases under that act, and that could be a positive thing. Um, Giuseppe Solsky from Women's Electoral Group has a this is one of those big questions. We're <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, looking, looking messianically looking for you for answers. But I'd like you, I'd like to, uh, I'd like you to reflect on that period in government which you were um, when you were in the office of the state status of women, and there was such a strong machinery of government with many senior feminists in very critical positions. All of that has been now expunged. Should we be arguing for its return, or is there some other way we ought to be seeking a more effective policy and programmatic environment in government? Look, I don't think that it's um, prudent uh, to to want to reinvent the past. You know, I think what worked in the eighties um, is not necessarily going to work. In fact, I'm sure it wouldn't work now. I mean, you know, the age of the democrat probably is sadly over. It's great while it lasted. Um, <laughs> we didn't show it has. We have beige suits and sensible <laughs> shoes <laughs> and briefcases. Um, maybe it's false uh, But I think that model, you know, is probably behind us. I mean, one of the things that's changed dramatically about government is the outsourcing of policy, and I think, which I think is shameful. And you know, the, the, the removal of policy, I know somebody made a point, Paul Barrett, who's a former head of defence, who's very active on Twitter, for those of you who follow, um, he made the point the other day that for this government to have appointed, this is like a sidebar, looks like, to have appointed um, Tony Abbott and Barnaby Joyce as ambassadors to whatever, why would you put a point members of parliament to be ambassadors? This is work the public service used to do. You know, this is the, so the whole constituent work of the public service and the policy did not include it, which is what the public servants used to do. And the whole reason we went into the bureaucracy as Democrats, because that's where the power was and that's where the policies were made and that's where we could have been changed. So if that's no longer where it's happening, you know, we, we have to look at where it's happening and figure out you know, where, where we fit us in. But, you know, there still is an office for women in Canberra. Uh, we don't hear much about them, but I, I, I wish they could be a little more strategic in what they do. I mean, I don't, maybe they are, but I don't know if they're directly here. And we don't see much evidence of um, you know, good women's policy in this government. I don't know what Labor's planning to do, if they do, next election. But I think uh, with everything, we've got to, we've got to adapt and, and reinvent ourselves in this era. And I, I think we want to wait until we can make the government taste as well. Hi, my name is Isabel. I'm actually an undergrad here at UTS. I'm in orthopedia and and social sciences. Um, I had a question recently. We just went down to boys. Um, what came out about sexual harassment and sexual assault at universities? <coughs> I wanted to ask, obviously you wrote your article in the 1970s about Sydney and the culture surrounding um, sexual assault, sexual harassment within the university. 40 years on, we're still dealing with this. Um, you seem to have policy that's great. There's also a culture of, um, I guess, either you speak out against it and you're labelled something uh, radical for saying that you don't want to be assaulted, um, or um, you're complicit in this kind of um, this behaviour and this um, culture of assault. And I wanted to ask, um, I guess, what your thoughts on it, um, what, what are your thoughts on it, especially considering that as a university, sort of seen that we're the most radical people around at the moment. Um, where the, um, the change is supposed to come from if you're still experiencing such a huge populace of those people as well. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm not sure you can answer you. I'm not as familiar with, I'm not involved with university, um, so I'm not, I'm not as familiar with on the ground um, cultures as, as obviously you are, so I don't know. But I'll just make a point about being on the forefront of change. I mean, the fact that uh, the university sector is investigating this and writing these reports, and there is such awareness of it and pushback 
God and this is why we pray the way against it shows that you are hiding it. So that I would be proud of that. Um, the fact that this behavior persists and the fact that um, um, you know, is, is something is reprehensible and, 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 and shameful. I'm really sorry about that. It seems to be something that's happened. You know, there's a lot of this stuff in the States. You know, there's a lot of things everyone is writing about um, sexual harassment and other forms of sexual abuse culture and on campuses and universities. It does seem to have increased a lot, I think, in the last time I was writing about that it was more um, America, I think, where it's now seen as more kind of normal behavior. And that perhaps is a reflection of you know, some of the trends in our culture at the moment um, with certain types of male behavior, which say very much except you know, good on you and don't, don't worry about what people call you. that have been happening um, with these refugees in New South Wales and also the transformation of other refugees from physically being on benefits <coughs> driven organisation to being in these kind of toxic waste organisations or um, into recruitment bodies and um, what are your thoughts on those closures and transformations and also um, I'm really interested in what those um, service communities and the women that expertise in that field can apply to their own yeah, yeah. I'm very pleased to hear that you're writing about this, and I think um, hope your research um, will involve um, perhaps you know, creating um, more histories of some of those communities. Um, which ones are you looking at? Um, I'm looking at Mason, yes. Harvey, and Mason. Um, I'm looking at Harry's place in Mason, um, Lynn's place in Tyree, which is now um, changed hands, yeah. and Marina Refuge in Cross Harbour. So it's been very tricky. Great. I'm, I'm really glad you're doing that. It's a really important piece of history, and uh, we need that st those stories um, to be to be written and to be you know, preserved and to be accessible. I mean, my point in asking what I think about what happened, you know, what I think you know, it's just so shameful. I mean, Elsie from Women's Refuge, you know, us in this all operate nine to five. You know, run by men is just you know a hot shit, and they certainly didn't want to have anything to do with that. Um, and we all have other things to talk about. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, one of the things that, that we, it, it goes back to an earlier question about, you know, losing things that we thought were cemented in, into, our, into our structure, into the system. That is a prime example of that with the refugees in New South Wales. And, um, we are having to adapt. I mean, there's a whole new, I don't know if anyone's sitting here, she's, she's pioneered a whole new model um, of community-based refugees funded by community uh, philanthropy and, and community uh, effort and um, that's a model that's very different from what used to exist in the, the, the faith-based or the uh, you know, religious based in Hudson and Paul Salvation Army model that existed before Elsie and I think what Harry is doing is terrific and it's also responsible, it's, it's, it goes out and finds areas of need and, and, and creates refugees in areas of need. So I, and one of the things I'm very interested in is looking at new models of refugee funding. I think to accept the fact that government funding is never going to be sufficient. It, we may not even get it at all in the future, uh, but we're still going to have a need for refugees in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. So we have to be realistic about that and we have to find ways of, of raising money. And one of the things that struck me when, when you know, I haven't had anything to do with Elsie for years and years, decades, but people are still ringing up all the time and saying, oh, I want to give money to Women's Refuge, how do I do it? And we couldn't, there was no way to do it. So you know, we've got to find some ways of being able to enable people in the community who want to give money 
to, to these services to be able to do so. And I, you know, I'm interested in working in that area as well. So, you know, we're going to, again, we have to regroup and we have to reimagine how we do things, but you know, where the need is there, we'll fill the need. We have time for one last question. My name is Rebecca and I'm a midwife. Um, over the last 20 years as a midwife, I've seen the conversation around birth change and there's um, big conversations now around birth trauma, birth violence, birth rape. And I guess I just wanted to ask you about your thoughts around the patriarchy of medicine and science that is that protects what they are able to do to women sitting behind the, protect, the protection of, you know, saying that it's best evidence or that this is, you know, what is the best thing for you. And yet women are coming out of these um, instances extremely traumatised. Um, well, I'm horrified to hear that. I'm afraid I don't really know anything about it. I've never done had any personal experiences or have studied, so I, I, I'm not familiar with it, so I can't really say very much, but in any other area of society where um, men are abusing their, their power to abuse women, particularly women in a very vulnerable situation, that is either birth or other, other reasons, it's a problem. So I can't really more than that. Yes, in fact, do you want to come back and ask a question? Thank you for continuing to inspire us. And I think a lot of us would love to know, after this yet another incredible achievement, what's next for her? <laughs> well, in the next two weeks, I'm going to continue to be travelling around Australia, uh, talking about my book. To, uh, I'm so thrilled that, that um, there's such interest uh, from groups all around the country. And I'm even going to well, Queensland next week. Um, not to Queensland, but um, <laughs> Townsville, which is close. And I'm just really um, extremely gratified and, and, and happy that, that there is such interest in talking about these issues and talking about um, interest in my life as a bit of a template for how you know, other women can, can take charge of their lives. And so I'm going to be doing that for the next two weeks and then I'm going back to New York, which is where I'm currently living because my partner really took the job there. So I'm just going to be there. Um, I'm not sure what the next project will be. Thank you. Now, if you're interested, Anne is appearing on Saturday on the panel on narrative non-fiction. So I, I, I think the tickets are still available. So if you're interested, please do drop by. And please um, join me in thanking Anne for the gift of the Sale in the foyer and Anne will happily in